Welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie, a slice of faith for our messy lives. I'm Tony Kolank, a professor at Ave Maria School of Law, and the father of five grown children, and also the author of inspirational fiction for teens and adults. By the way, it is finally out. My newest middle grade novel, Penny and the Stolen Chalice, published by our Sunday Visitor. Great modern mystery that takes place in a Catholic school. So it's a great read for your child, ages eight and up, and I hope you will check it out on my website. But today we are speaking with Catherine Briggs about the importance of classical education to raising faithful youth. My guest today is Catherine Briggs, an award-winning author and a middle school teacher in classical education. She's been writing since she was three years old, and she's had her short stories and articles published in multiple venues, has won several awards for her writing. She's also lived in countries all around the world in her childhood, and now she lives in Texas with her husband. Her debut young adult fantasy novel, The Eternity Gate, was published in September 2023. Catherine, it is wonderful to have you on The Shepherd's Pie. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today, Tony. So before we get into your writing, uh, what is the deal with you living all over the world as a child? How did that happen? Were you a military brat? No, my dad worked for an oil company and they would relocate us to different countries. In fact, often there were periods of my life where my dad would go to a country where we weren't permitted to go for whatever reason. So we would live in a country that was closer to him, but he would come and visit us. And it was a neat opportunity getting to just see God's people all over the world, see different cultures. It was wonderful. Great. And so you've also been clearly writing uh, since you were very young. So tell us a little bit about your writing. And actually, I wonder if all that traveling some way uh, impacted your desire to write. You know, no one has ever said that before. And I think you're right, because I like to think of my style of writing fantasy or my tiny subgenre as journey fantasy. I really like to explore different worlds within the world I've made for my characters. I did start writing when I was three. I think my mom gave me a notebook and some crayons, and I just started drawing little monsters, which is funny. I don't know why. <laughs> And I would create these stories with animals and different things. And my mom was so kind. She would sit down later and write down the words for me because I couldn't write yet. So why did you uh, decide to write a book in the fantasy genre? I loved growing up reading fantasy books. I love Narnia. I love Lord of the Rings, of course. We all do. And growing up, finding more, especially by written by people of faith, I think that fantasy allows us to see the world and our own lives through a different lens and to maybe see some things more clearly. And I just, I just love it. It's fun to explore those themes in that way. And as we read the Bible too, I mean, there are parts of the Bible that are just so fantastical and just so, so fun to think about. Nobody is as creative as God and to try to explore themes in our, in our small ways in a similar way is just very rewarding. All right. So tell us about your debut release, The Eternity Gate. It's not the only book, I don't think, in this uh, series. Uh, it's going to be a duology at this point, and I love the series so much. But The Eternity Gate is about an ancient doorway that was lost long ago and said to hold either amazing wealth and power or just awful judgment. And Sayo, handmaiden to the princess of her country, Lejon, holds the key to The Eternity Gate. Now, is this an entirely different world, or is this in our world where there's this gate to another world? Uh, portal fantasy. I love portal fantasies. The Eternity Gate's not quite that, but there are definitely flavors from our world in this book, because I just think that's fun. Again, our world is so creative. It's fun to borrow things, and it adds a touch of realism also to the book. There are some... South Korean themes, very subtle in one country. And there's another country that kind of has a Roman flair, just a little bit. And I, I think that's fun, kind of a fusion. Now you lived in South Korea for a while, didn't you? I lived there, or I guess stayed there just for a month with one of my best friends. But living, I lived more in, uh, in Europe, France, Italy. So I need to probably do a fusion with France or Italy at some point too. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about sort of what the plot is like or some of your main characters? Absolutely. 
Seo is the main character. And again, she's handmade into the princess. And in her country of Lejon, people are gifted with the ability to hold light in their hands. But Seo did not inherit that gifting. She is half-blooded. And because of her mother's blood, she actually possesses a gifting to manipulate fire, but to be able to walk through fire. And to her, that's considered a curse. It's more of an enemy gifting, and she tries to hide it. And she actually serves in the temple of her country, trying to make herself perfect and trying to hide this thing that she doesn't like about herself. The Eternity Gate is full of mystery. <laughs> Very powerful. It's sought by many different countries, many powerful kings, and even monsters that start kind of coming out of the woodworks to find it now that it's been rediscovered in a way. But again, journey fantasy, they don't know exactly where the Eternity Gate is. So also a bulk of the book is Seo and her friends trying to find it as well. Now, what is the age range for uh, your books? What would be the sweet spot age to read this? The sweet spot age? would be, according to my publisher, and I trust them and believe them in this, 13 plus to understand the themes of the book. But I teach middle school and I have many middle school students who have read it and enjoyed it as well. So like any book, it kind of, I think, depends on the emotional maturity of the child as well and your family values. Yeah, I agree. I was I was shocked at a, uh, you know, I sometimes talk to different middle school classrooms about writing and whatever in my books. And I had one girl raise her hand and say, yeah, I read the entire Harry Potter series in second grade. And I was like, are you kidding? So if a second grader could read that, I'm sure a middle schooler could read your 13 plus <laughs> book. Absolutely. Yes. And that is shocking because that series was not even supposed to be read that quickly. It's supposed You're supposed to grow up with that series too, which yes. So, all right. So uh, you're a Christian. Obviously, you mentioned already reading authors who are uh, faith inspired is something you enjoy. Is faith in this series of yours? And, and how is it in there? It is. It is the theme. It's, it's tricky because God is multifaceted, right? We have to be extremely respectful. And I would even say cautious in how we represent him in our fiction because it's so hard. He's so He's so much bigger than us. And I like... Tozer's The Attributes of God. And so I thought, okay, let's find one aspect that I can do my very best to represent. And for the Eternity Gate, a large part of the theme would be obedience and grace, and that we can't do it. We can't do it on our own, but we need to be faithful to what God has called us to. So in the world you created, how does God is it the Trinity? Is it is it some sort of a single uh, personed God or, or is it not that specific? I love that you asked that question because I think that is so, so, so important and so hard to do as an author. In the Eternity Gate, I believe in a triune God. In the Eternity Gate, that's not made very clear. It would seem more like one God. In the second book that I'm actually currently performing developmental edits on with my editor right now, I'm enjoying getting to, I guess, flesh out more of a triune God. And that, that's so fun. I love it. Yeah, well, of course, uh, the Old Testament, it's not very clear on its face that God is a trinity there. So I could see how you could have a, uh, a society that might not recognize those attributes at that point. All right, so connect all of this then to classical education. I'm assuming this book might actually be a good book to read for a classically educated student, but for those who might not be aware of what that even means, what is classical education about? The way I see classical education, big picture is the pursuit of the good, true, and beautiful, and how that represents God, and how even ancient cultures, how they maybe did not quite find God, but we're so close. And maybe they did. They were so close to describing this divine ultimate being and how we can see that in different countries and different cultures, but of course in the Bible primarily. And also how we, I think in modern culture, tend to compartmentalize so many aspects of our life and classical education is helping us see everything as connected together. There's math and music, things like that that are just fun to explore and also kind of drawing us back to 
the great conversation and learning from those great thinkers who've come before us and continuing from there. So we hear a lot these days about the importance of classical education. And I've seen articles talking about how Christian schools are in some ways Parents are wanting to send their kids to Christian schools, uh, sometimes because of the classical education piece. So is there a difference between just like education you might find in any typical public or private school and a school like yours that focuses on classical education? Like, isn't all education classical education? (laughs) Oh, I wish it was. That would be awesome. We, at the classical schools I've taught at, I've had the privilege of teaching it too at this point, we are aiming to help with parents in a collaborative model because teachers cannot do it alone. Parents are just key, of course, to help grow humans who are well-rounded in all areas, who are well-rounded to know how to continue learning into their adulthood. I've heard at conferences and different things they'll talk about how we need plumbers, which is a very important job, who continue to read the classics and to be deep thinkers. And no matter what, it's it's not just about forming somebody who can earn a lot of money. Like that shouldn't just be the end goal. I have a good job and thus I make a lot of money and I'm happy because we know that that doesn't provide happiness. We want to shape people who have tasted, tasted the Lord tasted what is true, good, and beautiful, and to continue to seek after that and to grow in that and to help build up society to be, again, more well-rounded. So is one of the hallmarks of classical education actually reading the classics directly as opposed to just like having them summed up in some textbook or something? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And even sometimes in the original language, there's a focus on learning Latin and then Greek in high school. And each school is a little bit different on how much emphasis they put on that. But that's just wonderful what that unlocks in your brain and how you are able to read original text. At least some of it would be awesome. What might make this a more appealing way to educate your kid than, and I don't even know if how different might it be from public schools. You said you were homeschooled, so you probably never went to a public school, but you may have some familiarity as a teacher on, uh, on some of the differences. In classical education, we want to form or help shape people who know the Lord well and have thought through the harder issues of life, who have a good understanding of how the world works. To be, I mean, being specialized is wonderful, but to be more well-rounded than that, and then to be able to think clearly through the gray areas of life, and then to be able to have discourse with others that is calm and persuasive and to be able to help shape society in a better direction than it's going now. So going back to your book then, The Eternity Gate, it's a fantasy novel written for 13 plus, but you have middle schoolers reading it. Is this sort of like a guilty pleasure for classically educated children, or is there actually a tie-in to classical education, even in a fantasy novel like that? I think any art form, including I think even movies, that can look at some aspect of human nature from all different angles and ask really good questions, I think in a way is classical. And also to be truly classical, to seek after what is noble and what is good. There's so much fiction today. We've both have probably read a lot of this where the morality is so gray and it's so focused on self And to me, truly classical pieces of art are seeking the ultimate good and they're seeking nobility. Like I'm reading your book, Shadow in the Dark, right now. And I love the nobility of even the young protagonist. And to me, that's classical. Yeah, you know, as an an author, I often want to portray the world as it is. I don't want to sugarcoat or paint some reality that's so far off from what the experience of the world is that it's really just not something we can connect to. But you talk about sort of the murky questions of morality and this kind of thing. You know, our characters have to encounter real life moral dilemmas. 
Some of them are kind of in gray areas. I'm, I'm curious how you or a, a classical type author might address that issue that you pointed out here, that the morality in a lot of our fiction today is not classical because if anything, it seems to embrace immorality. But how do you present these difficult moral issues, but in a way that would be in pursuit of the good, true and beautiful? The fiction that I read where it falls short of this is where they slap a Band-Aid on a difficult issue or they make something that is not a good path to take. They'll, they'll show a, an inferior path to take in life and they'll show it as the most amazing thing all the time. And that we could do that too. We could show, oh, having faith in God and Jesus is going to make everything great all the time. I'll never have a hardship again. I mean, that, that could be our way of doing that. And it's not true. It's not nuanced. And I think both sides of fiction are, have done this and are doing this where we're you can just preach a ton and you're trying to really communicate something and kind of bash somebody over the head with this is the way things work. But I think just asking questions and presenting realistic scenarios that are well-researched that ring true to life that aren't, again, like you said, sugar-coated, and then letting the characters walk that out imperfectly because they're, you know, model, they're like real people. I think that is powerful and that's what I don't always see. And I wish I saw more of it because then the reader is left able to think about it instead of just being told, here's the lesson. Now go and go live. So for those listeners who might have, you know, their kids or grandkids in a public school and they're like, oh gosh, I would have loved to have sent them to classical education school, but that's not what their reality is. Uh, do you have any advice for them on how they can try to bring some of this pursuit of the good, true, and beautiful to their kids? Yes, I do. Finding connections between the different things they're learning would be a huge first step. Also, reading really solid classical books that have withstood time that have shaped culture that speak truth is very important. Looking at different issues from all angles. And again, with the most classical education is built on a biblical foundation, not all of it, it's been growing a lot and changing, but most of it is. So you're looking at the gray, difficult areas of life that really smart adults can't quite figure out. It's so hard looking at it from different points of view and then looking at it through the lens of the Bible, I think would be a great classical approach. Yeah. So as you pointed out before, the Bible itself is filled with all different kinds of literature and stories, but always we kind of can see the pursuit of the, the good, true, and beautiful there. Are there certain classics that you would recommend that are must-reads for kids in middle school or high school that, that you would uh, say to a listener, yes, definitely get your kid this book? Yes, there are so many good books to choose between. Every year I read The Hobbit with my students and the representation of classical ideals, heroism, nobility are so strong in that book. I love Anna Green Gables a lot. And I find that the boys and girls in my classes enjoy that and enjoy watching Anne's character arc. And they just laugh. They love it. Those two are probably my current favorites. I'm also a big fan of The Princess and the Goblin. But of course, I'm a fantasy author. <laughs> What's interesting is the books that you're suggesting aren't even um, maybe what some people might view as classical books. Like, you know, I'm thinking, well, shouldn't they be reading The Last Days of Socrates or something, um, maybe something from Shakespeare? But that's not where you went with that. Uh, so maybe kind of tie that around. Like, so how is it that we can get this classical concepts without having to necessarily dive into some ancient text? That's a great question building blocks. They're taking baby steps, right? If they read Plato in fifth grade, <laughs> they're, even when they read it in high school or uh, depending on your school, middle school, upper middle school, it's so tricky because you want to expose them really young. This, this is debated a lot. You want to expose them to these things when they're young because even at high school level, they're not going to get it all. I mean, I could read a lot of the things you just mentioned again and again, and I would get more and more from them. They're so thick, which is wonderful. So yeah, I would see the books that I suggest is more like stepping stones. All right. So let's connect this back to faith then, because again, a lot of uh, Christian parents want their kids classically educated. How does this tie back to 
the faith of our kids? I mean, is how is this helpful in building up the faith? Yes. What is the difference between a Christian school and a classical school? Their resurgence of classical education is relatively new, like probably the last 20 years where the interest has fallen back on this type of education. And a lot of parents will enroll their children in the schools I've taught at for the Christian aspect. And I just think for classical education, big picture, the deep roots of the older texts that we tend to kind of rush under the rug because they're scary or they don't align or they're difficult or they don't align exactly with our theology. I mean, Plato doesn't line up perfectly with the Bible. And it's easy to say, oh, like it's not even close. So it's easy to say, oh, let's just, let's get rid of that. But there's is this huge conversation through centuries and centuries of people searching for God and getting very close to knowing him and also having good ideas on how to structure society as well. And classical education goes really, really deep connecting all of these thoughts, bringing them back to Christ, especially the early church did so much work with that. And it's, it's amazing to study and research. I enjoy learning more about that as I continue to teach. I just think the depth, the depth in the history and the tradition of the classical education approach is wonderful. And, and there are all these smaller aspects to a wonderful book besides Dorothy Sayers essay about education is the seven laws of teaching. That's a fantastic baseline book that parents could read if they're wanting to classically educate their children, even if they're not in a classical school, just a way to structure the education they are receiving in a more classical way that's more cohesive. Yeah, when I think about it too, I like the phrase that you used earlier, the, the pursuit of the good, true, and beautiful. Well, if you're pursuing what is good, true, and beautiful, you're pursuing God, because God is the epitome of truth, goodness, and beauty. And so even if it's not explicitly Christian, I think by training kids along those lines, we're training them to search for God in, in some way, as opposed to what seems to be maybe the opposite goal of a lot of modern fiction for our youth, it seems to be to train them away from God. And I don't know if, if you want to comment on that or if I'm a little off base. No, you are on base. And that would be the ultimate issue, right? The foundational issue. All right. So last words of advice to our listeners who are interested in classical education for their kids or grandkids, what would you advise them if they came up to you and were like, oh, this sounds really cool. What should I do? How do I start? Where do I even go to see more about this? The best place to start would be, if it depends on their needs, if they're looking for a classical school, I would absolutely go and tour a classical school that's near you. If you're looking for something more like a co-op, there are classical conversations, co-ops everywhere, and they're a wonderful resource if you're more in the homeschooling realm. If you're wanting to homeschool classically, I would definitely check out curriculum companies like Veritas Press and Memoria Press, classical academic press, and you will find so many resources and wonderful discourses about why to classically educate as well and how to do it as a homeschooler. Great. Well, people will hopefully get a hold of those resources. And if they want to get a hold of your resources, the Eternity Gate, learn more about you, uh, where would you like them to go? I love to connect with people through my email newsletter. You can find that at my website at katherinebriggs.com. In class, Catherine with a classical spelling. <laughs> I'm also on Instagram. My handle is at Catherine Briggs underscore author. And the Eternity Gate, book one and the Threshold Duology can be found on pretty much anywhere books are sold. When does the book two come out? Book two is scheduled to come out September of this year, 2024. And the Ooh, cover okay. reveal is supposed to happen in March. Yay! Very cool. Well, good luck with that. And congratulations on getting the Eternity Gate out. And I hope that folks will check it out. It's, it's good fantasy. And I'd like to say I like to read young adult fiction, too. So it's not just for kids, you know, parents and grandparents can read it on their own and enjoy it. I know I get that kind of comment a lot from folks who even read my Harwood Mysteries. 
Oh, absolutely. There's a huge group of adults who like YA fiction. I think, oh yes, me too, me too. Obviously I'm reading your book. <laughs> Well, Catherine, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Thanks for writing classically and for teaching classically and all that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me today, Tony. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the show today. We've been speaking with Catherine Briggs about classical education and its importance in raising faithful youth. Again, this is Anthony Barone Colank. If you want to check out any of my writing or how to get me be a speaker in your school, come to my website, antonycolank.com. But until next time, may God bless us as we rely on our faith to work through the messy challenges of our lives. Thank you.